Okay, so this uh, lecture is about um, camera technology and especially over uh, an, an historical uh, duration. Um, I, I like to think about how lucky we are to live in the contemporary era in which really high end, basically professional quality cameras are available to, to basically everyone. Um, certainly the camera that's in all of our telephones is thousands of times better than the camera that I used as a film student or the camera that I used as an outsider filmmaker. Um, and the fact that there are now billions of these cameras around the world really has democratized the uh, filmmaking um, art form, right? And I have this theory that the very best films from this era are gonna be from obscure people from around the world that had no money and that they're somehow gonna percolate to the top is what my thinking is. So Hollywood's gonna do what it does and the rest of us outsider filmmakers are gonna do what they do with their um, digital cameras. But I wanted to, to kind of ground that conversation in some camera technology history. Um, so first of all, let's talk about let's talk about the image itself. And this is this is a, a digital camera image, and um, it's a, a take on scan lines. And so when we talk about 4K versus HD versus SD, and then we get into 6K and 12K and these really really big um, fields, this is exactly what we're talking about. We're counting the number of scan lines across the um, horizontal axis. So in this case, in the case of 4K video, there are 4,000 lines scanning in this direction. Uh, this is HD or approximately HD, a little bit more than HD here. And then this is 6K and it just gets larger and larger as we go with that same aspect ratio. Um, and so when we look at an old analog television camera, which was, um, you know, SD, the size of that image as compared to this image is, is tiny, right? And so what does that mean? That means if you take an old uh, shot and blow it up to this size, it's going to lose resolution. And um, let's say it's been transferred to digital from analog. Every pixel is going to have to cover more space than an individual pixel at its right size in this 6K image. It also means, interestingly, that if we're shooting in this super high resolution and we are editing and outputting in something smaller, like say we're editing and outputting for YouTube, um, and that is 4K at best, maybe it's HD, maybe it's not even full HD, maybe it's, it's just regular HD, uh, but a significantly smaller image space. What that means with these gigantic cameras is you can select part of the frame and move that part of the frame into the 4K space, lose all of this information, but not lose any resolution. And it continues downward as well. So if you were to take this image and bring it down into a 2K output, um, you've now really got a ton of area that you can play with. You can either compress it all and make it look like a really nice shot, or you can select that piece that best represents your, your filmmaking and have that be your movie. So it gives you a lot of um, uh, space, leeway as a, um, as a filmmaker um, to have all that extra resolution because you may not capture exactly the very best part of the image and it may help you to um, output in a, a lower resolution because you know ultimately that's where it's gonna be seen on people's phones coming out of their pockets around the world. Um, outputting really high resolution video into that smaller window gives you a lot of space to play around with what you actually show. And so that's where scan lines, um, where scan lines are important, either in blowing up and losing resolution, in shrinking and gaining resolution, or in shrinking and taking just a small piece of the, uh, of the image. Okay, so let's go back in time. We're going back to the patent for Thomas Edison's first film camera. Obviously this was, um, this was analog, right? It was, um, film cameras were invented in both the United States and uh, in France, probably in England as well. There's a lot of dispute over who invented it first, but it was 
being developed simultaneously in multiple countries around the world. Um, and, uh, you know, Thomas Edison had the patent, but really he wasn't the actual inventor of this. It was invented by his whole team. Think about uh, Bill Gates and Microsoft, who's writing the code and whose name is on the, on the front door. Um, but what you have here is you have a mechanism where, where un, uh, unused film is pulled past the lens, the aperture opens, um, it takes an image, and then it, the aperture closes and the film moves, moves back through the lens. And we all understand that, moves past the lens for the next image. Um, and so that is the, uh, the interior design, the patent application for Thomas Edison's first film camera. So pretty neat to look at, pretty neat to think about. Um, here is the uh, Eastman still camera, right? The Eastman uh, Brownie camera. And what's so interesting, uh, I think, when you think about the, the early Eastman Brownie camera and the early Edison film camera, one was adopted, this one was adopted worldwide by professionals and amateur photographers, whereas the film camera really kind of grew into an industry only tool, right? So you had the film industry, the business that made films in Paris and in New York and then ultimately in Hollywood. Um, it was very expensive. It was, um, you know, kind of hard to do, whereas these brownie cameras became uh, easier for individuals to use. And I think also um, because you print a photograph and put it on your wall, that had a kind of um, a, a kind of uh, a display component that I think made it uh, more more uh, attractive to the non-professional photographer, right? And so even at the very beginning of film versus phot photography, um, a division that still exists today, um, we saw one being used by everybody and one being used by professionals only. And I think that's an interesting way of framing how this, how these tracks developed, how they separated out very early. You had professional film cameras for, uh, you know, close to a century. Um, cameras like where you could see someone wearing a really nice Nikon camera around their neck in the 1970s, but you didn't see someone carrying a really expensive professional film camera around to uh, ball games or family parties. Um, you had what were home movies and much smaller cameras. And so I'm going to talk about that as well, because ultimately I want to get to the point where they merge back together, right? So we have a separating out at the end of the 19th century. We have two tracks where they develop along those two tracks. And then at some point, we're going to see a patent application where they finally theoretically come together, even though uh, that patent application may not have been achieved exactly as intended. It is a sort of theoretical bringing together of these two tools, which is where we are um, today. So let's let's take a look at some of these other uh, patent applications that get us to that kind of remerging. So here's a 1950s home movie camera. Um, this was used by a lot of amateur people. You know, you could see um, home movies probably in your family's uh, library uh, in their collection. But I think that the, the important distinction here is that these, these images marked themselves as amateur uh, almost from the moment they were created. They just didn't look like real movies, right? They looked like home movies. And so there's a sort of separating out of the amateur filmmaker from the real or the professional filmmaker and the reason I bring that up as a theme is because that's a barrier. That's a barrier to people who don't live in Hollywood, who don't have millions of dollars, and who want to become filmmakers. But their only option would be to shoot on uh, one of these older, smaller resolution, eight millimeter uh, film cameras. And it just was impossible. You couldn't break down the barriers of Hollywood if this is what you had uh, to shoot on. Now, there were a few experimental filmmakers who used this camera. Um, and, um, you know, they made really interesting films. But as far as making films that felt like real movies, um, there's a huge chasm between what you can shoot with this home movie camera and what you could shoot with, say, a Panavision camera. Okay, a little bit later application, the Hi8 film camera. This is what I studied on when I was an undergraduate. We had these um, Hi8 film cameras, and we would 
stick the film canister in and uh, send it out for development. And then we would tape our movies together for film class. Um, and again, it just felt like you were playing at it. It didn't feel like real uh, movie making. Um, there was a complete distinction between real movies and what we were doing uh, in school. Um, okay, so I have here, and it's kind of hard to see it to train your, your head a little bit. This is the patent application from 1996 in which someone conceived of a camera where you could shoot both video and stills. So somebody saw this coming and hadn't yet been uh, brought to market. There wasn't yet an iPhone, which could do both. Somebody put in a patent application and said, let's have a mechanism in which you can, in the same camera, using the same 35 millimeter film stuff, either shoot um, a still or a movie. So fascinating leap of, of uh, intuition here. Uh, because I do think this patent application prefigures everything that we do now. And it's pretty pretty neat to look at, to think about theoretically. I mean, it's it's a bulky design, and you could see how this would be difficult to kind of carry around and use. But it also, in some ways, looks like a Canon 5D DSLR to me. I mean, it feels like uh, this intuition was achieved in some real ways you know after 2010 2011 when the um prosumer dslr started hitting the market and suddenly you had that ability to do all of this stuff in one camera body and so from 1996 to 2010 it was really sort of a theoretical construct but certainly after 2010 it changed filmmaking because this is where i think you start to see the beginnings of the pressing in between those barriers, the home movie maker and the professional movie maker. And suddenly with this construct, now everything is, is um, changed. Everything's changed and, it, and these cameras are really revolutionary. I think uh, in my lifetime, nothing has changed filmmaking as much as the DSLR. Even though I now believe we're out of the DSLR period and into something else, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but I do think this was the most revolutionary um, uh, tool in filmmaking since the invention of the film camera uh, in the late 19th century. Um, okay, so here's just a closer look at the mechanism. They're essentially using the same lens, the same focal length, uh, but uh, this mechanism could be dialed to move. Um, to move the move the uh, the tool the the um, the 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 lens itself uh, into uh, a still position or into a video or a filmmaking position, and that that for me is a fascinating theoretical construct. Again, even though it didn't ever actually work from this patent, it took a long time to come to market, and it was changed. Right, the DSLR doesn't use this. Um, uh, but anyway, so here's where we were at the um, end of the 2010s, right? This is a um, Panasonic HD unibody video camera, and it has on it what was called a lettuce adapter. And a lettuce adapter could fake the shallow focal length of um, of the film look on video by taking a series of, of uh, mirrors and pushing parts of the image out of focus. And so this was a very popular tool in the 2010 period because it was the only way at that point to get something that looked professional from a really, uh, a really inexpensive video camera. And so this setup was really pretty common, um, especially the lettuce adapter. They were expensive. They were nice to use and they created um, a really nice look. And uh, we used this for my um, graduate student feature. And I'll tell you, uh, sometimes we would have it on, sometimes we would have it off, created fascinating looks in both ways. And uh, we took the video from this camera to Milan and got a cinematography award because it was just so interesting to look at in that period uh, before uh, the DSLR. So that, that's an interesting hybrid between 
where we were and where we're going just a few years later with the uh, DSLR. So the big, um, the big uh, um, invention, the thing that really changed DSLRs completely was the CMOS sensor. And um, it's, it's ontologically similar to film because for the first time, you weren't taking video and breaking it into its component pieces, recording those component pieces, and then reassembling them at some point um, in the editing process. You were, or at some point in the recording process onto the media. Uh, with a CMOS sensor, you're capturing every pixel as it is, light level, color level. So it's, it's similar ontologically to film is the argument that I would make that for the first time in a digital camera, we have an image that feels filmic where every pixel is captured as a pixel. It goes onto the recording medium as a pixel that, that reflects the real world. And um, it goes into the editing system in the same way. So there's no breaking a part of it, and pushing it back together. And uh, we're starting to get with these cameras resolution that's approaching film, right? It's not yet, it's not yet there. And if you were to go back in time and look at um, DSLR footage from 2011, 2012, it's remarkably better than other video cameras, but it's still not uh, a movie. It's not quite a movie yet. And so you're still seeing, even in student films, for example, where students are using DSLRs, um, say the Canon 5D Mark I, they're using those DSLRs really with high skill, but you can still feel that it's a student movie, right? But this sensor is getting us closer to just a few years later, where we end up with the Canon 5D, you know, Mark III, Mark IV, and they're really the, the Mark III is where the lines are completely squashed. And then certainly the, um, the iPhone and then a camera I'm going to talk about in a second, which is the mirrorless uh, DSLR or whatever we're going to end up calling that. So um, I loved these Canon cameras. I think they revolutionized filmmaking. But I believe that the DSLR era is over. I think it was a short-lived period of time. It was extremely revolutionary. But um, the SLR mechanism that's in one of these cameras is no longer needed. You no longer need the SLR, which is a series of mirrors that reflects the light through an eyepiece so you can see what the, the uh, medium is seeing. Because on the next generation of these, as you all know, um, we got video, um, video monitors on the back of the camera. So when you buy a mirrorless DSLR, it's a kind of a misnomer because the SLR is not there. The mirror is what makes the DSLR. So this, the mirrorless DSLR is a marketing tool, but it's not really uh, an exact name for the kind of cameras that we are uh, now using. So these, I think, are the, uh, are the, the, um, the end of the revolutionary period, where now we have a camera, and I'm gonna show you a few more here, black magic and red, where we now we have a period where student filmmaking and professional filmmaking are in the same space aesthetically. So ontologically, it's one pixel, whether it's on film or an analog pixel or an analog space on, on analog film or the one pixel on the, uh, the sensor for this, uh, say, Sony Alpha uh, Alpha Seven uh, camera. So ontologically, it's it's very similar, and aesthetically, it is as well. Because when you look at a piece of film versus the image that comes out of the the mirrorless SLR, or the Black Magic, or the Red Epic, they're pretty close aesthetically. You know, ninety nine to a hundred percent. I mean, there's a such a small range now that all of those problems that used to happen with outsider filmmakers, with students who wanted to break down the door of Hollywood, all that stuff's gone away, right? And so now, finally, we're through the revolution and we're in the period where our cameras are as good as their cameras. Um, but let's go through. Let's just look at a few more of, the, of their cameras and we'll finish this up. 
Um, so this is the kind of camera that most news channels use. It's a unibody camera. And the idea with this is that um, you have to run and gun with it. You, you don't want a news person to have to be um, fumbling with lenses and plugging in the microphone as they're running after a news source. So in most news operations, this is still the um, uh, this is still the standard where you you don't want to you want to be able to pick it up by the handle and run out and capture your video in really high quality, and they're still pre these are still pretty expensive. Probably most are outside the range of student filmmakers. Here, obviously, is our Black Magic camera. Um, here, here is an example of um, a, a high end news camera, unibody again with an interchangeable lens. Uh, and a 4G connection where you can uh, replace uh, the um, television studio, the satellite truck, with one of these cameras, but still awfully expensive. And so now we're starting to see uh, live link where you can just plug in uh, an internet connection to your, uh, to your video camera, and you can do news gathering, live television shows from anywhere in the world. Again, the price is compressing so much to, that we're getting to the point where a YouTuber with a home studio can make something that looks as good as, say, NBC uh, Nightly News. This obviously is the high-end film camera. This is $120,000 at least. Most, most film productions rent this. But I would ask the question, do you really need to spend that much money on this camera when the mirrorless SLR with the cinematic lens uh, can get you, um, you know, aesthetically so close uh, to that image. And then finally, this is what it's all replacing in the professional world. We're getting rid of the million dollar satellite truck. We're getting rid of the $60,000 uh, uh, beta cam, digital, digital news camera. And all of that also is being compressed down into a space where if we want to make a news channel, if we want to make a movie, if we want to be a YouTuber, we can do all of this stuff, high-end aesthetics for fractions, one one hundredth, sometimes one one thousandth of the, uh, of the price. So that's it for this lecture. Thank you.